Part two, chapter five of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The coming of the Jesuits. The effect on Anthony of Mr. Buxton's conversation was very considerable. He had managed to keep his temper very well during the actual interview, but he broke out alone afterwards, at first with an angry contempt. The absurd arrogance of the man made him furious. The arrogance that had puffed away England and its ambitions and its vigor, palpable evidences of life and reality, and further of God's blessing, in favor of a miserable Latin nation which had the presumption to claim the possession of Peter's chair and of the person of the vicar of Christ. Test it said the young man to himself by the ancient fathers and councils that dr jewel quoted so learnedly and the preposterous claim crumbled to dust test it yet again by the finger of providence and god himself proclaimed that the pretensions of the spiritual kingdom of which the prisoner in the cell had bragged are but a blasphemous fable and anthony reminded himself of the events of the previous year three great assaults had been made by the papists to win back england to the old religion dr william allen the founder of douay college had already for the last seven or eight years been pouring seminary priests into england and over a hundred and twenty were at work among their countrymen preparing the grand attack this was made in three quarters at once in scotland it was chiefly political and anthony thought with a bitter contempt of the count d'aubigny esme stuart who was supposed to be an emissary of the jesuits how he had plotted with the ecclesiastics and nobles and professed protestantism to further his ends and of all the stories of his duplicity and evil living told round the guard-room fire in ireland the attempt was little else than ludicrous anthony laughed fiercely to himself as he pictured the landing of the treacherous fools at dingle of sir james fitzmaurice and his lady very wretched and giddy after the voyage and the barefooted friars and dr sanders and the banner so solemnly consecrated and of the sands of smerwick when all was over a year later and the six hundred bodies men and women who had preferred mr buxton's spiritual kingdom to elizabeth's kindly rule stripped and laid out in rows like dead game for lord grey de wilton to reckon them by but his heart sank a little as he remembered the third method of attack and of the coming of the jesuits by last july all london knew that they were here and men's hearts were shaken with apprehension they reminded one another of the april earthquake that had tolled the great westminster bell and thrown down stones from the churches one of the lambeth guards a native of blunsdon in wiltshire had told anthony himself that a pack of hell hounds had been heard there in full cry after a ghostly quarry phantom ships had been seen from bodmin attacking a phantom castle that rode over the waves off the cornish coast an old woman of blazedon had given birth to a huge-headed monster with the mouth of a mouse eight legs and a tail and worse than all it was whispered in the somersetshire inns that three companies of black-robed men sixty in number had been seen coming and going overhead in the gloom these two strange emissaries fathers persons and campion how they appealed to the imagination lurking under a hundred disguises now of servants now of gentlemen of means and position it was known that they were still in england going about doing good their friends said who knew them stirring up the people their enemies said who were searching for them anthony had seen with his own eyes some of the papers connected with their presence that containing a statement of their objects in coming 
namely that they were spiritual not political agents seeking recruits for christ and for none else campions challenge and brag offering to meet any english divine on equal terms in a public disputation besides one or two of the controversial pamphlets purporting to be printed at douay but really emanating from a private printing press in england as the government experts had discovered from an examination of the watermarks of the paper employed yet as the weeks went by and his first resentment cooled mr buxton's arguments more and more sank home for they had touched the very point where anthony had reckoned that his own strength lay he had never before heard nationalism and catholicism placed in such flat antithesis in fact he had never before really heard the statement of the catholic position and his fierce contempt gradually melted into respect both theories had a concrete air of reality about them his own imaged itself under the symbols of england's power the national church appealed to him so far as it represented the spiritual side of the english people and mr buxton's conception appealed to him from its very audacity this great spiritual kingdom striding on its way trampling down the barriers of temperament and nationality disregarding all earthly limitations and artificial restraints imperiously dominating the world in spite of the world's struggles and resentment this after all as he thought over it was well was a new aspect of affairs the coming of the jesuits too emphasized the appeal here were two men as the world itself confessed of exceptional ability for campion had been a famous oxford orator and persons a fellow of balliol choosing under a free will obedience first a life of exile and then one of daily peril and apprehension the very thought of which burdened the imagination with horror hunted like vermin sleeping and faring hard their very names detested by the majority of their countrymen with the shadow of the gallows moving with them and the reek of the hangman's cauldron continually in their nostrils and for what for mr buxton's spiritual kingdom well anthony thought to himself as the weeks went by and his new thoughts sank deeper if it is all a superstitious dream at least it is a noble one what too was the answer he asked himself that england gave to father campion's challenge and the defence that the government was preparing against the spiritual weapons of the jesuits new prisons at framingham and battersea new penalties enacted by parliament and above all the unanswerable argument of the rack and the gallows finally to close the discussion and what of the army that was being set in array against the priests and that was even now beginning to scour the country round berkshire oxfordshire and london anthony had to confess to himself that they were queer allies for the servants of christ for traitors liars and informers were among the most trusted government agents in short as the spring drew on anthony was not wholly happy again and again in his own room he studied a little manuscript translation of father campion's ten reasons that had been taken from a popish prisoner and that a friend had given him and as he read its exultant rhetoric he wondered whether the writer was indeed as insincere and treacherous as mr scott declared there seemed in the paper a reckless outspokenness calculated rather to irritate than deceive i turn to the sacraments he read none none not two not one o holy christ have they left their very bread is poison their baptism though it be true yet in their judgment is nothing 
it is not the saving water it is not the channel of grace it brings not christ's merits to us it is but a sign of salvation and again the writer cried to elizabeth to return to the ancient religion and to be in truth what she was in name the defender of the faith kings shall be thy nursing fathers thus isaiah sang and queens thy nursing mothers listen elizabeth most mighty queen to thee the great prophet sings he teaches thee thy part join then thyself to these princes o elizabeth a day a day shall come that shall show thee clearly which have loved thee better the society of jesus or luther's brood what arrogance thought anthony to himself and what assurance too meanwhile in the outer world things were not reassuring to the friends of the government it was true that half a dozen priests had been captured and examined by torture and that sir george peckham himself who was known to have harboured campion had been committed to the marshalsea but yet the jesuits influence was steadily on the increase more and more severe penalties had been lately enacted it was now declared to be high treason to reconcile or be reconciled to the church of rome overwhelming losses in fortune as well as liberty were threatened against all who said or heard mass or refused to attend the services of the establishment but as was discovered from papers that fell from time to time into the hands of the government agents the only answer of the priests was to inveigh more strenuously against even occasional conformity declaring it to be the mortal sin of schism if not of apostasy to put in an appearance under any circumstances except those of actual physical compulsion at the worship in the parish churches worse than all too was the fact that this severe gospel began to prevail recusancy was reported to be on the increase in all parts of the country and many of the old aristocracy began to return to the faith of their fathers lords arundel oxford vaux henry howard and sir francis southwell were all beginning to fall under the suspicion of the shrewdest government spies the excitement at lambeth ran higher day by day as summer drew on the net was being gradually contracted in the home counties spies were reported to be everywhere in inns in the servants quarters of gentlemen's houses lounging at crossroads and on village greens campion's name was in every mouth now they were on his footsteps it was said now he was taken now he was gone back to france now he was in london now in lancashire and each rumour in turn corrected its predecessor anthony shared to the full in the excitement the figure of the quarry after which so many hawks were abroad appealed to his imagination he dreamed of him at night once as a crafty-looking man with narrow eyes and stooping shoulders that skulked and ran from shadow to shadow across a moonlit country once as a ruddy-faced middle-aged gentleman riding down a crowded street and several times as a kind of double of mr stuart whom he had never forgotten since he had watched him in the little room of maxwell hall gallant and alert among his enemies at last one day in july as it drew on towards evening and as anthony was looking over the stable accounts in his little office beyond the presence chamber a buzz of talk and footsteps broke out in the court below and a moment later the archbishop's body-servant ran in to say that his grace wished to see mr norris at once in the gallery that opened out of the guard-room and i think it's about the jesuits sir added the man evidently excited anthony ran down at once and found his master pacing up and down with a courier waiting near the steps at the lower end that led to chichely's tower the archbishop stopped by a window emblazoned with cardinal pole's emblem and beckoned to him see here master norris he said i have received news that campion is at last taken it may well be false as so often before 
but take horse if you please and ride into the city and find the truth for me i will not send a groom they believe the maddest tales you are at liberty he added courteously yes your grace i will ride immediately as he rode down the river bank towards london bridge ten minutes later he could not help feeling some dismay as well as excitement at the news he was to verify and yet what other end was possible but what a doom for the brilliant oxford orator even though he had counted the cost streams of excited people were pouring across the bridge into the city campion's name was on every tongue and anthony as he passed under the high gate noticed a man point up at the grim spiked heads above it and laugh to his companion there seemed little doubt from the unanimity of those whom he questioned that the rumour was true and some even said that the jesuit was actually passing down cheapside on his way to the tower when at last anthony came to the thoroughfare the crowd was as dense as for a royal progress he checked his horse at the door of an inn-yard and asked an ostler that stood there what it was all about it is campy in the jesuit sir said the man he has been taken at lyford and is passing here presently the man had hardly finished speaking when a yell came from the end of the street and groans and hoots ran down the crowd anthony turned in his saddle and saw a great stir and movement and then horses and men's heads moving slowly down over the seething surface of the crowd as if swimming in a rough sea he could make little out as the company came towards him but the faces of the officers and pursuivants who rode in the front rank four or five abreast then followed the faces of three or four others also riding between guards and anthony looked eagerly at them but they were simple faces enough a little pale and quiet one was like a farmer's ruddy and bearded surely campion could not be among those then more and more riding two and two with a couple of armed guards with each pair some looked like countrymen or servants some like gentlemen and one or two might be priests but the crowd seemed to pay them no attention beyond a glance or two ah what was this coming behind there was a space behind the last row of guards and then came a separate troop riding all together of half a dozen men at least and one in the centre with something white in his hat the ferment round this group was tremendous men were leaping up and yelling like hounds round a carted stag clubs shot up menacingly and a storm of ceaseless execration raged outside the compact square of guards who sat alert and ready to beat off an attack once a horse kicked fiercely as a man sprang to his hindquarters and there was a scream of pain and a burst of laughing anthony sat trembling with excitement as the first group had passed and this second began to come opposite the entrance where he sat this then was the man the rider in the centre sat his horse somewhat stiffly and anthony saw that his elbows were bound behind his back and his hands in front the reins were drawn over his horse's head and a pursuivant held them on either side the man was dressed as a layman in a plumed hat and a buff jerkin such as soldiers or plain country gentlemen might use and in the hat was a great paper with an inscription anthony spelt it out campion the seditious jesuit then he looked at the man's face it was a comely refined face a little pale but perfectly serene his pointed dark brown beard and moustache were carefully trimmed and his large passionate eyes looked cheerfully about him anthony stared at him wholly fascinated for above the romance that hung about the hunted priest and the glamour of the dreaded society which he represented there was a chivalrous fearless look in his face that drew the heart of the young man almost irresistibly at least he did not look like the skulking knave at whom all the world was sneering and of whom anthony had dreamed so vividly a few nights before the storm of execration from the faces below 
and the faces crowding at the windows seemed to affect him not at all and he looked from side to side as if they were cheering him rather than crying against him once his eyes met anthony's and rested on them for a moment and a strange thrill ran through him and he shivered sharply and yet he felt too a distinct and irresistible movement of attraction towards this felon who was riding towards his agony and passion and he was conscious at the same time of that curious touch of wonder that he had felt years before towards the man whipped at the cart's tail as to whether the solitary criminal were not in the right and the clamorous accusers in the wrong campion in a moment had passed on and turned his head in that moment too anthony caught a sudden clear instantaneous impression of a group of faces in the window opposite there were a couple of men in front stout city personages no doubt with crimson faces and open mouths cursing the traitorous papist and the crafty vagrant fox trapped at last but between them looking over their shoulders was a woman's face in which anthony saw the most intense struggle of emotions the face was quite white the lips parted the eyes straining and sorrow and compassion were in every line as she watched the cheerful priest among his warders and yet there rested on it too a strange light as of triumph it was the face of one who sees victory even at the hour of supremest failure in an instant more the face had withdrawn itself into the darkness of the room when the crowds had surged down the street in the direction of the tower yelling in derision as campion saluted the lately defaced cheapside cross anthony guided his horse out through the dispersing groups realizing as he did so with a touch of astonishment at the coincidence that he had been standing almost immediately under the window whence he and isabel had leaned out so many years before the sun was going down behind the abbey as he rode up towards lambeth and the sky above and the river beneath were as molten gold the abbey itself with westminster hall and the houses of parliament below stood up like mystical palaces against the sunset and it seemed to anthony as he rode as if god himself were illustrating in glorious illumination the closing pages of that human life of which a glimpse had opened to him in cheapside it did not appear to him as it had done in the days of his boyish love as if heaven and earth were a stage for himself to walk and pose upon but he felt intensely now the dominating power of the personality of the priest and that he himself was no more than a spectator of this act of a tragedy of which the priest was both hero and victim and for which this evening glory formed so radiant a scene the old intellectual arguments against the cause that the priest represented for the moment were drowned in this flood of splendour when he arrived at lambeth and had reached the archbishop's presence he told him the news briefly and went to his room full of thought and perplexity in a few days the story of campion's arrest was known far and wide it had been made possible by the folly of one catholic and the treachery of another and when anthony heard it he was stirred still more by the contrast between the jesuit and his pursuers the priest had returned to the moated grange at lyford after having already paid as long a visit there as was prudent owing to the solicitations of a number of gentlemen who had ridden after him and his companion and who wished to hear his eloquence he had returned there again said mass on the sunday morning and preached afterwards from a chair set before the altar a sermon on the tears of the saviour over apostate jerusalem but a false disciple had been present who had come in search of one pain and this man known afterwards by the catholics as judas eliot or eliot iscariot had gathered a number of constables and placed them about the manor-house and before the sermon was over he went out quickly from the table of the lord 
the house was immediately surrounded and the alarm was raised by a watcher placed in one of the turrets after eliot's suspicious departure the three priests present campion and two others were hurried into a hiding hole over the stairs the officers entered searched and found nothing and were actually retiring when eliot succeeded in persuading them to try again they searched again till dark and still found nothing mrs yate encouraged them to stay the night in the house and entertained them with ale and then when all was quiet insisted on hearing some parting words from her eloquent guest he came out into the room where she had chosen to spend the night until the officers were gone and the rest of the catholics some brigittine nuns and others met there through private passages and listened to him for the last time as the company was dispersing one of the priests stumbled and fell making a noise that roused the sentry outside again the house was searched and again with no success in despair they were leaving it when jenkins eliot's companion who was coming downstairs with a servant of the house beat with his stick on the wall saying that they had not searched there it was noticed that the servant showed signs of agitation and men were fetched to the spot the wall was beaten in and the three priests were found together having mutually shriven one another and made themselves ready for death campion was taken out and sent first to the sheriff of berkshire and then on towards london on the following day the summer days went by and every day brought its fresh rumour about campion sir owen hopton governor of the tower who at first had committed his prisoner to little ease now began to treat him with more honour he talked too mysteriously of secret interviews and promises and understandings and gradually it began to get about that campion was yielding to kindness that he had seen the queen that he was to recant at paul's cross and even that he was to have the see of canterbury this last rumour caused great indignation at lambeth and anthony was more pressed than ever to get what authentic news he could of the jesuit then at the beginning of august came a burst of new tales he had been racked it was said and had given up a number of names and as the month went by more and more details authentic and otherwise were published those favourably inclined to the catholics were divided in opinion some feared that he had indeed yielded to an excess of agony others and these proved to be in the right when the truth came out that he had only given up names which were already known to the authorities though even for this he asked public pardon on the scaffold towards the end of august the archbishop again sent expressly for anthony and bade him accompany his chaplain on the following day to the tower to be present at the public disputation that was to take place between english divines and the jesuit now he will have the chance he craved for said grindal he hath bragged that he would meet any and all in dispute and now the queen's come and see hath granted it him on the following day in the early morning sunshine the minister and anthony rode down together to the tower where they arrived a few minutes before eight o'clock and were passed through up the stairs into st john's chapel to the seats reserved for them it was indeed true that the authorities had determined to give campion his chance but they had also determined to make it as small as possible he was not even told that the discussion was to take place until the morning of its occasion and he was allowed no opportunity for developing his own theological position the entire conduct of the debate was in the hands of his adversaries he might only parry seldom repost and never attack when anthony found himself in his seat he looked round the chapel almost immediately opposite him on a raised platform against a pillar stood two high seats occupied by deans noel and day who were to conduct the disputation and who were now talking with their heads together while a secretary was arranging a great heap of books on the table before them 
on either side east and west stretched chairs for the divines that were to support them in debate should they need it and the platform on which anthony himself had a chair was filled with a crowd of clergy and courtiers laughing and chatting together a little table also heaped with books with seats for the notaries stood in the centre of the nave and not far from it were a number of little wooden stools which the prisoners were to occupy plainly they were to be allowed no advisers and no books even the physical support of table and chairs was denied to them in spite of their weary racked bodies the chapel bright with the morning sunlight that streamed in through the east windows of the bare norman sanctuary hummed with the talk and laughter of those who had come to see the priest baiting and the vindication of the protestant religion though as anthony looked round he saw here and there an anxious or a downcast face of some unknown friend of the papists he himself was far from easy in his mind he had been studying campion's ten reasons more earnestly than ever and was amazed to find that the very authorities to which dr jewell deferred namely the scriptures interpreted by fathers and councils and illustrated by history were exactly campion's authorities too and that the jesuits appeal to them was no less confident than the protestants that fact had of course suggested the thought that if there were no further living authority in existence to decide between these two scholars christendom was in a poor position when doctors differed where was the layman to turn to his own private judgment said the protestant but then campion's private judgment led him to submit to the catholic claim this then at present weighed heavily on anthony's mind was there or was there not an authority on earth capable of declaring to him the revelation of god for the first time he was beginning to feel a logical and spiritual necessity for an infallible external judge in matters of faith and that the catholic church was the only system that professed to supply it the question of the existence of such an authority was with the doctrine of justification one of those subjects continually in men's minds and conversations and to anthony unlike others it appeared more fundamental even than its companion all else seemed secondary indulgences the mass absolution the worship of mary and the saints all these must stand or fall in god's authority made known to man the one question for him was where was that authority to be certainly found there came the ringing tramp of footsteps the buzz of talk ceased and then broke out again as the prisoners with all eyes bent upon them surrounded by a strong guard of pikemen were seen advancing up the chapel from the northwest door towards the stool set ready for them anthony had no eyes but for campion who limped in front supported on either side by a warder he could scarcely believe at first that this was the same priest who had ridden so bravely down cheapside now he was bent and walked like an old broken man his face was deathly pale with shadows and lines about his eyes and his head trembled a little there were one or two exclamations of pity for all knew what had caused the change and anthony heard an undertone moan of sorrow and anger from someone in a seat behind him the prisoners sat down and the guards went to their places campion took his seat in front and turned immediately from side to side running his dark eyes along the faces to see where were his adversaries and once more anthony met his eyes and thrilled at it through the pallor and pain of his face the same chivalrous spirit looked out and called for homage and love that years ago at oxford had made young men mockingly nicknamed after their leader to desire his praise more passionately than anything on earth and even to imitate his manners and dress and gait for very loyalty and devotion 
Anthony could not take his eyes off him. He watched the clear-cut profile of his face thrown fearlessly forward, waited in tense expectation to hear him speak, and paid no attention to the whisperings of the chaplain beside him. Presently the debate began. It was opened by Dean Noel from his high seat, who assured Father Campion of the disinterested motives of himself and his reverend friends in holding this disputation. It was, after all, only what the priest had demanded, and they trusted by God's grace that they would do him good and help him to see the truth. There was no unfairness, said the dean, who seemed to think that some apology was needed in taking him thus unprepared, since the subject of debate would be none other than Campion's own book. The Jesuit looked up, nodded his head, and smiled. I thank you, Mr. Dean, he said in his deep, resonant voice, and there fell a dead hush as he spoke. I thank you for desiring to do me good, and to take up my challenge but I must say that I would I had understood of your coming, that I might have made myself ready. Campion's voice thrilled strangely through Anthony, as the glance from his eyes had done. It was so assured, so strong, and delicate an instrument, and so supremely at its owner's command, that it was hardly less persuasive than his personality and his learning that made themselves apparent during the day and anthony was not alone in his impressions of the jesuit lord arundel afterwards attributed his conversion to campion's share in the discussions again and again during the day a murmur of applause followed some of the priests clean-cut speeches and arguments and a murmur of disapproval the fierce thrusts and taunts of his opponents and by the end of the day's debate so marked was the change of attitude of the crowd that had come to triumph over the papist and so manifest their sympathy with the prisoners that it was thought advisable to exclude the public from the subsequent discussions on this first day all manner of subjects were touched upon such as the comparative leniency of catholic and protestant governments the position of luther with regard to the epistle of st james and other matters comparatively unimportant in the discussion of which a great deal of time was wasted campion entreated his opponents to leave such minor questions alone and to come to doctrinal matters but they preferred to keep to details rather than to principles and the priest had scarcely any opportunity to state his positive position at all the only doctrinal matter seriously touched upon was that of justification by faith and texts were flung to and fro without any great result. "'We are justified by faith,' cried one side. "'Though I have all faith, and have not charity, I am nothing,' cried the other. The effect on Anthony of this day's debate arose rather from the victorious personality of the priest than from his arguments. His gaiety, too, was in strange contrast to the solemn puritanism of his enemies. For instance, he was on the point that councils might err in matters of fact, but that the scriptures could not. As for example, he said, his eyes twinkling out of his drawn face, I am bound, under pain of damnation, to believe that Toby's dog had a tail, because it is written, he wagged it. The deans looked sternly at him as the audience laughed now now said one of them it becomes not to deal so triflingly with matters of weight campion dropped his eyes demurely as if reproved why then he said if this example like you not take another i must believe that saint paul had a cloak because he willeth timothy to bring it with him again the crowd laughed and anthony laughed too with a strange sob in his throat at the gallant foolery which after all was as much to the point as a deal that the deans were saying but the second day's debate held in hopton's hall was on more vital matters and anthony again and again found himself leaning forward breathlessly as doctors good and folk on the one side and campion on the other respectively attacked and defended the doctrine of the visible church for this for anthony 
was one of the crucial points of the dispute between catholicism and protestantism anthony believed already that the church was one and if it was visible surely he thought to himself it must be visibly one and in that case it is evident where that church is to be found but if it is invisible it may be invisibly one and then as far as that matter is concerned he may rest in the church of england if not and then he recoiled from the gulf that opened it must be an essential mark of the church said campion and such a quality as is inseparable it must be visible as fire is hot and water moist good answered that when christ was taken and the apostles fled then at least the church was invisible and if then why not always it was a church in coate answered the priest beginning not perfect but good continued to insist that the true church is known only to god and therefore invisible there are many wolves within he said and many sheep without i know not who is elect retorted campion but i know who is a catholic only the elect are of the church said good i say that both good and evil are of the visible church answered the other to be elect or true members of christ is one thing went on good and to be in the visible church is another as the talk went on anthony began to see where the confusion lay the protestants were anxious to prove that membership in a visible body did not ensure salvation but then the catholics never claimed that it did the question was did or did not christ intend there to be a visible church membership in which should be the normal though not the infallible means of salvation they presently got on to the a priori point as to whether a visible church would seem to be a necessity there is a perpetual commandment said the priest in matthew eighteen tell the church but that cannot be unless the church is visible ergo the visibility of the church is continual when there is an established church said good this remedy is to be sought for but this cannot be always had the disease is continual answered campion ergo the remedy must be continual then he left the a priori ground and entered theirs to whom should i have gone he cried before luther's time what prelates should i have made my complaint unto in those days where was your church nine hundred years ago whose were john huss jerome of prague the waldenses were they yours then he turned scornfully to fulk help him master doctor and fulk repeated good's assertion that valuable as the remedy is it cannot always be had anthony sat back puzzled both sides seemed right persecution must often hinder the full privileges of church membership and the exercise of discipline yet the question was what was christ's intention was it that the church should be visible it seemed that even the ministers allowed that now and if so why then the catholics claim that christ's intention had never been wholly frustrated but that a visible unity was to be found amongst themselves surely this was easier to believe than the protestant theory that the church which had been visible for fifteen centuries was not really the church at all but that the true church had been invisible in spite of christ's intention during all that period and was now to be found only in small separated bodies scattered here and there how of the prevailing of the gates of hell if that were allowed to be true at two o'clock they reassembled for the afternoon conference and now they got even closer to the heart of the matter for the subject was to be 
whether the church could err fulke asserted that it could and did and made a syllogism whatsoever error is incident to every member is incident to the whole but it is incident to every member to err ergo to the whole i deny both major and minor said campion quietly every man may err but not the whole gathered together for the whole hath a promise but so hath not every particular man fulke denied this stoutly and beat on the table every member hath the spirit of christ he said which is the spirit of truth and therefore hath the same promise that the whole hath why then said campion smiling there should be no heretics yes answered fulke heretics may be within the church but not of the church and so they found themselves back again where they started from anthony sat back on the oak bench and sighed and glanced round at the interested faces of the theologians and the yawns of the amateurs as the debate rolled on over the old ground and touched on free will and grace and infant baptism until the lieutenant interposed master doctors he said with a judicial air the question that was appointed before dinner was whether the invisible church may err to which good retorted that the digressions were all campion's fault then the debate took the form of contradictions whatsoever congregation doth err in matters of faith said good is not the true church but the church of rome erreth in matters of faith ergo it is not the true church i deny your minor said campion the church of rome hath not erred then the same process was repeated over the council of trent and the debate whirled off once more into details and irrelevancies about imputed righteousness and the denial of the cup to the laity again the audience grew restless they had not come there most of them to listen to theological minutiae but to see sport and this interminable chopping of words that resulted in nothing bored them profoundly a murmur of conversation began to buzz on all sides campion was in despair thus shall we run into all questions he cried hopelessly and then we shall have done this time twelve months but folk would not let him be but pressed on a question about the council of nice now we shall have the matter of images sighed campion you are nemis acutus retorted folk you will leap over the stile or ever you come to it i mean not to speak of images and so with a few more irrelevancies the debate ended the third debate in september on the twenty third at which anthony was again present was on the subject of the real presence in the blessed sacrament folk was in an evil temper since it was common talk that campion had had the best of the argument on the eighteenth the other day he said when we had some hope of your conversion we forbear you much and suffered you to discourse but now that we see you are an obstinate heretic and seek to cover the light of the truth with multitude of words we mean not to allow you such large discourses as we did you are very imperious to-day answered campion serenely whatsoever the matter is i am the queen's prisoner and none of yours not a whit imperious said folk angrily though i will exact of you to keep the right order of disputation then the argument began it soon became plain to anthony that it was possible to take the scripture in two senses literally and metaphorically the sacrament either was literally christ's body or it was not who then was to decide father campion said it meant the one dr fulk the other could it be possible that christ should leave his people in doubt as to such a thing 
surely not thought anthony well then where is the arbiter father campion says the church dr fulke says the scripture but that is a circular argument for the question to be decided is what does the scripture mean for it may mean at least two things at least so it would seem here then he found himself face to face with the claims of the church of rome to be that arbiter and his heart began to grow sick with apprehension as he saw how that church supplied exactly what was demanded by the circumstances of the case that is an infallible living guide as to the meaning of god's revelation the simplicity of her claim appalled him he did not follow the argument closely since it seemed to him but a secondary question now though he heard one or two sentences at one point campion was explaining what the church meant by substance it was what transcended the senses are you not dr fulke he said and yet i see nothing but your colour and exterior form the substance of dr fulke cannot be seen i will not vouchsafe to reply upon this answer snarled fulke whose temper had not been improved by the debate too childish for a sophister then followed interminable syllogisms of which campion would not accept the premises and no real progress was made the jesuit tried to explain the doctrine that the wicked may be said not to eat the body in the sacrament because they receive not the virtue of it though they receive the thing but folk would not hear him the distinction was new to anthony with his puritan training and he sat pondering it while the debate passed on the afternoon discussion too was to little purpose more and more anthony and others with him began to see that the heart of the matter was the authority of the church and that unless that was settled all other debate was beside the point and the importance of this was brought out for him more clearly than ever on the twenty seventh of the month when the fourth and last debate took place and on the subject of the sufficiency of the scriptures unto salvation mr chark who had now succeeded as disputant began with extempore prayer in which as usual the priest refused to join praying and crossing himself apart mr walker then opened the disputation with a pompous and insolent speech about one campion an unnatural man to his country degenerated from an englishman an apostate in religion a fugitive from this realm unloyal to his prince campion sat with his eyes cast down until the minister had done then the discussion began the priest pointed out that protestants were not even decided as to what were scriptures and what were not since luther rejected three epistles in the new testament therefore he argued the church is necessary as a guide first of all to tell men what is scripture walker evaded by saying he was not a lutheran but a christian and then the talk turned on to apocryphal books but it was not possible to evade long and the jesuit soon touched his opponent to leave a door to traditions he said which the holy ghost may deliver to the true church is both manifest and seen as in the baptism of infants the holy ghost proceeding from father to son and such other things mentioned which are delivered by tradition prove these directly by the scripture if you can chark answered by the analogy of circumcision which infants received and by quoting christ's words as to sending of the comforter and they were soon deep in detailed argument but once more anthony saw that it was all a question of the interpretation of scripture and therefore that it would seem that an authoritative interpreter was necessary and where could such be found save in an infallible living voice and once more a question of campions drove the point home was all scripture written when the apostles first taught 
and Chark dared not answer yes. The afternoon's debate concerned justification by faith, and this, more than ever, seemed to Anthony a secondary matter, now that he was realizing what the claim of a living authority meant, and he sat back, only interested in watching the priest's face, so controlled, yet so transparent in its simplicity and steadfastness, as he listened to the minister's brutal taunts and insolence, and dealt his quiet, skilful parries and reposts to their incessant assaults. At last the lieutenant struck the table with his hand, and intimated that the time was past, and after a long prayer by Mr. Walker the prisoners were led back to their cells. As Anthony rode back alone in the evening sunlight, he was as one who was seeing a vision. There was indeed a vision before him that had been taking shape gradually, detail by detail, during these last months, and ousting the old one, and which now, terribly emphasized by Campion's arguments and illuminated by the fire of his personality, towered up imperious consistent dominating and across her brow her title the catholic church far above all the melting cloudland of theory she moved a stupendous fact living in contrast with the dead past to which her enemies cried in vain eloquent when other systems were dumb authoritative when they hesitated steady when they reeled and fell about her throne dwelt her children from every race and age secure in her protection and wise with her knowledge when other men faltered and questioned and doubted and as anthony looked up and saw her for the first time he recognized her as the mistress and mother of his soul and although the blinding clouds of argument and theory and self-distrust rushed down on him again and filled his eyes with dust yet he knew he had seen her face in very truth and that the memory of that vision could never again wholly leave him end of chapter five part two chapter six of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain some contrasts in the lambeth household the autumn passed by uneventfully the rigour of the archbishop's confinement had been mitigated and he had been allowed now and again to visit his palace at croydon but his inactivity still continued as the sequestration was not removed elizabeth had refused to listen to the petition of convocation in eighty for his reinstatement anthony went down to the old palace once or twice with him and was brought closer to him in many ways and his affection and tenderness towards his master continually increased grindal was a pathetic figure at this time with few friends in poor health out of favour with the queen who had disregarded his existence and now his afflictions were rendered more heavy than ever by the blindness that was creeping over him the archbishop, too, in his loneliness and sorrow, was drawn closer to his young officer than ever before, and gradually got to rely upon him in many little ways. He would often walk with Anthony in the gardens at Lambeth, leaning upon his arm, talking to him of his beloved flowers and herbs, which he was now almost too blind to see, telling him queer facts about the properties of plants, and even attempting to teach him a little irrelevant botany now and then. They were walking up and down together soon after Campion's arrest one August morning, before prayers in a little walled garden on the river that Grendel had laid out with great care in earlier years. Ah, oh, said the old man, I am too blind to see my flowers now, Mr. Norris, but I love them none the less, and I know their places. Now there he went on pointing with his stick there i think grows my mastic or marum perhaps i smell it however what is that flower like mr norris anthony looked at it and described its little white flowers and its leaves 
that is it said the archbishop i thought my memory served me it is a kind of marjoram and it has many virtues against cramps convulsions and venomous bites so galen tells us then he went on to talk of the simple old plants that he loved best of the two kinds of basil that he always had in his garden and how good it was mixed in sack against the headache and the male pennyroyal and how well it had served him once when he had great internal trouble mr gerard was here a week or two ago mr norris when you were down at croydon for me he is my lord burleigh's man he oversees his gardens at wimbledon house and in the country he was telling me of a rascal he had seen at a fair who burned henbane and made folks with the toothache breathe in the fumes and then feigned to draw a worm forth from the aching tooth but it was no worm at all but a lute string that he held ready in his hand there are sad rascals abroad mr norris the old man waxed eloquent when they came to the iris bed ah oh, mr norris the flowers de luce are over by now i fear but what wonderful creatures of god they are with their great handsome heads and their cool flags i love to hear a bed of them rustle all together and shake their spears and nod their banners like an army in array and then they are not only for show apuleius says that they are good against the gout i asked mr gerard whether my lord had tried them but he said no he would not at the violet bed he was yet more emphatic i think mr norris i love these the best of all they are lowly creatures but how sweet and like other lowly creatures exalted by their maker to do great things as his handmaidens the leaves are good against inflammations and the flowers against ague and hoarseness as well and then there is oil of violets as you know and violet syrup and sugar violet then they are good for blisters garlands of them were an ancient cure for the headache as i think dioscorides tells us and they are the best of all cures for some children's ailments and so they walked up and down together the archbishop talking quietly on and on and helping quite unknown to himself by his tender irrelevant old man's talk to soothe the fever of unrest and anxiety that was beginning to torment anthony so much now his conversation like the very flowers he loved to speak of was good against inflammations anthony came to him one morning thinking to please him and brought him a root that he had bought from a travelling peddler just outside the gateway this is a mandrake root your grace i heard you speak of it the other day the archbishop took it smiling felt it carefully peered at it a minute or two no my son he said i fear you have met a knave this is briony root carved like a mandrake into the shape of a man's legs it is worthless i fear but i thank you for the kind thought mr norris and he gave the root back to him and the stories we hear of the mandrake i fear are fables too some say that they only grow beneath gallows from that which falls there that the male grows from the corruption of a man's body and the female from that of a woman's but that is surely a lie and a foul one too and then folks say that to draw it up means death and that the mandrake screams terribly as it comes up and so they bid us tie a dog to it and then drive the dog from it so as to draw it up so i asked mr baker the chirurgeon in the household of my lord oxford the other day about that and he said that such tales be but doltish dreams and old wives fables but the true mandrake is a clean and wholesome plant the true ointment populion should have the juice of the leaves in it and the root boiled and strained causes drowsiness 
it hath a predominant cold faculty galen saith but its true home is not in england at all it comes from mount garganus in apulia it was pathetic anthony thought sometimes that this old prelate should be living so far from the movements of the time owing to no fault of his own during these months the great tragedy of campion's passion was proceeding a couple of miles away but the archbishop thought less of it than of the death of an old tree the only thing from the outside world that seemed to ruffle him was the behaviour of the puritans anthony was passing through le velvet room one afternoon when he heard voices in the presence chamber beyond and almost immediately heard the archbishop who had recognized his step call his name he went in and found him with the stranger in a dark sober dress take this gentleman to mr scott he said and ask him to give him some refreshment for that he must be gone directly when anthony had taken the gentleman to the steward he returned to the archbishop for any further instructions about him no mr norris my business is done with him he comes from my lord of norwich and must be returning this evening if you are not occupied mr norris will you give me your arm into the garden they went out by the vestry door into the little cloisters and skirting the end of the creek that ran up by chichely's water tower began to pace up and down the part of the garden that looked over the river my lord has sent to know if i know aught of one robert brown with whom he is having trouble this mr brown has lately come from cambridge and so my lord thought i might know something of him but i do not this gentleman has been saying some wild and foolish things i fear and desires that every church should be free of all others and should appoint its own minister and rule its own affairs without interference and that prophesyings should be without restraint now you know mr norris i have always tried to serve that party and support them in their gospel religion but this goes too far where were any governance at all if this were to come about where were the rule of faith the power of discipline nay where were the unity for which our saviour prayed it liketh me not the good dr freke as his messenger tells me feels as i do about this and desires to restrain mr brown but he is so hot he will not be restrained and besides he is some kin to my lord burley so i fear his mouth will be hard to stop anthony could not help thinking of mr buxton's prediction that the church of england had so repudiated authority that in turn her own would one day be repudiated a papist prisoner your grace he said said to me the other day that this would be sure to come that the whole principle of church authority had been destroyed in england and that the church of england would more and more be deserted by her children for that there was no necessary centre of unity left now that peter was denied it is what a papist is bound to say replied the archbishop but it is easy to prophesy when fulfilment may be far away indeed i think we shall have trouble with some of these zealous men and the queen's grace was surely right in desiring some restraint to be put upon the exercises but it is mere angry raving to say that the church of england will lose the allegiance of her children anthony could not feel convinced that events bore out the archbishop's assertion everywhere the puritans were becoming more outrageously disloyal there were everywhere signs of disaffection and revolt against the authorities of the establishment even on the part of the most sincere and earnest men many of whom were looking forward to the day when the last rags of popery should be cast away and formal presbyterianism inaugurated in the church of england episcopal ordination was more and more being regarded as a merely civil requirement but conveying no ministerial commission recognition by the congregation with the laying on of the hands of the presbyterate was the only ordination they allowed as apostolic 
Anthony said a word to the archbishop about this. "'You must not be too strict,' said the old man. "'Both views can be supported by the scriptures, and although the Church of England at present recognizes only episcopal ordination within her own borders, she does not dare to deny, as the papists fondly do, that other rites may not be as efficacious as her own.' that surely master norris is in accordance with the mind of christ that hath the spirit of liberty much as anthony loved the old man and his gentle charity this doctrinal position as stated by the chief pastor of the church of england scarcely served to establish his troubled allegiance during these autumn months too both between and after the disputations in the tower the image of campion had been much in his thoughts everywhere except among the irreconcilables the jesuit was being well spoken of his eloquence his humour and his apparent sincerity were being greatly commented on in london and elsewhere anthony as has been seen was being deeply affected on both sides of his nature the shrewd wit of the other was in conflict with his own intellectual convictions and this magnetic personality was laying siege to his heart and now the last scene of the tragedy more affecting than all was close at hand anthony was present first at the trial in westminster hall which took place during november and was more than ever moved by what he saw and heard there the priest as even his opponents confessed had by now won a marvellously good report to be such a man as his like was not to be found either for life learning or any other quality which might beautify a man and now here he stood at the bar paler than ever so numbed with racking that he could not lift his hand to plead that supple musician's hand of his once so skilful on the lute so that mr sherwin had to lift it for him out of the furred cuff in which he had wrapped it kissing it tenderly as he did so in reverence for its sufferings and he saw too the sleek face of elliot in his red yeoman's coat as he stood chatting at the back like another barabbas whom the people preferred to the servant of the crucified and above all he heard campion's stirring defence spoken in that same resonant sweet voice though it broke now and then through weakness in spite of the unconquerable purpose and cheerfulness that showed in his great brown eyes and round his delicate humorous mouth it was indeed an astonishing combination of sincerity and eloquence and even humour that was brought to bear on the jury and all in vain during those days if you want to dispute as though you were in the schools cried one of the court when he found himself out of his depth you are only proving yourself a fool i pray god said campion while his eyes twinkled i pray god make us both sages and in spite of the tragedy of the day a little hum of laughter ran around the audience if a sheep were stolen he argued again in answer to the presupposition that since some catholics were traitors therefore these were and a whole family called in question for the same were it good manner of proceeding for the accusers to say your great-grandfathers and fathers and sisters and kinfolk all loved mutton ergo you have stolen the sheep again in answer to the charge that he and his companions had conspired abroad he said as for the accusation that we plotted treason at rheims reflect my lords how just this charge is for see first we never met there at all then many of us have never been at rheims at all finally we were never in our lives all together except at this hour and in prison 
anthony heard too campion expose the attempt that was made to shift the charge from religion to treason there was offer made to us he cried indignantly that if we would come to the church to hear sermons and the word preached we should be set at large and at liberty so pascal and nichols two apostates otherwise as culpable in all offences as we upon coming to church were received to grace and had their pardon granted whereas if they had been so happy as to have persevered to the end they had been partakers of our calamities so that our religion was cause of our imprisonment and ex consequenti of our condemnation the queen's council tried to make out that certain secrets that campion in an intercepted letter had sworn not to reveal must be treasonable or he would not so greatly fear their publication to this the priest made a stately defence of his office and declaration of his staunchness he showed how by his calling as a priest he was bound to secrecy in matters heard in confession and that these secret matters were of this nature these were the hidden matters he said these were the secrets to the revealing whereof i cannot nor will not be brought come rack come rope and again when sergeant anderson interpreted a phrase of campion's referring to the great day to which he looked forward as meaning the day of a foreign papal invasion the prisoner cried in a loud voice o oh, judas judas no other day was in my mind i protest than that wherein it should please god to make a restitution of faith and religion whereupon as in every pulpit every protestant doth i pronounced a great day not wherein any temporal potentate should minister but wherein the terrible judge should reveal all men's consciences and try every man of each kind of religion this is the day of change this is the great day which i threatened comfortable to the well-behaving and terrible to all heretics any other day but this god knows i meant not then after the other prisoners had pleaded campion delivered a final defence to the jury with a solemnity that seemed to belong to a judge rather than a criminal the babble of tongues that had continued most of the day was hushed to a profound silence in court as he stood and spoke for the sincerity and simplicity of the priest were evident to all and combined with his eloquence and his strange attractive personality dominated all but those whose minds were already made up before entering the court what charge this day you sustain began the priest in a steady low voice with his searching eyes bent on the faces before him and what account you are to render at the dreadful day of judgment whereof i could wish this also were a mirror i trust there is not one of you but knoweth i doubt not but in like manner you forecast how dear the innocent is to god and at what price he holdeth man's blood here we are accused and impleaded to the death he began to raise his voice a little here you do receive our lives into your custody here must be your device either to restore them or condemn them we have no whither to appeal but to your consciences we have no friends to make there but your heeds and discretions then he touched briefly on the evidence showing how faulty and circumstantial it was and urged them to remember that a man's life by the very constitution of the realm must not be sacrificed to mere probabilities or presumptions then he showed the untrustworthiness of his accusers how one had confessed himself a murderer and how another was an atheist then he ended with a word or two of appeal god give you grace he cried to weigh our causes aright and have respect to your own consciences and so i will keep the jury no longer 
i commit the rest to god and our convictions to your good discretions when the jury had retired and all the judges but one had left the bench until the jury should return anthony sat back in his place his heart beating and his eyes looking restlessly now on the prisoners now on the door where the jury had gone out and now on judge ayloff whom he knew a little and who sat only a few feet away from him on one side he could hear the lawyers sitting below the judge talking among themselves and presently one of them leaned over to him good day mr norris he said you have come to see an acquittal i doubt not no man can be in two minds after what we have heard at least concerning mr campion we all think so here at any rate the lawyer was going on to say a word or two more as to the priest's eloquence when there was a sharp exclamation from the judge anthony looked up and saw judge ayloff staring at his hand turning it over while he held his glove in the other and anthony saw to his surprise that the fingers were all blood-stained one or two gentlemen near him turned and looked too as the judge still staring and growing a little pale wiped the blood quickly away with the glove but the fingers grew crimson again immediately spotty said ayloff half to himself tis strange there is no wound a moment later looking up he saw many of his neighbours glancing curiously at his hand and his pale face and hastily thrust on his glove again and immediately after the jury returned and the judges filed in to take their places anthony's attention was drawn off again and the buzz of talk in the court was followed again by a deep silence the verdict of guilty was uttered as had been prearranged and the queen's counsel demanded sentence campion and the rest said chief justice ray what can you say why you should not die then campion still steady and resolute made his last useless appeal it was not our death that ever we feared but we knew that we were not lords of our own lives and therefore for want of answer would not be guilty of our own deaths the only thing that we have now to say is that if our religion do make us traitors we are worthy to be condemned but otherwise are and have been true subjects as ever the queen had in condemning us you condemn all your own ancestors and as he said this his voice began to rise and he glanced steadily and mournfully round at the staring faces about him all the ancient priests bishops and kings all that was once the glory of england the island of saints and the most devoted child of the see of peter then as he went on he flung out his wrenched hands and his voice rang with indignant defiance for what have we taught he cried however you may qualify it with the odious name of treason that they did not uniformly teach to be condemned with these old lights not of england only but of the world by their degenerate descendants is both gladness and glory to us then with a superb gesture he sent his voice pealing through the hall god lives posterity will live their judgment is not so liable to corruption as that of those who are now about to sentence us to death there was a burst of murmurous applause as he ended which stilled immediately as the chief justice began to deliver sentence but when the horrible details of his execution had been enumerated and the formula had ended it was the prisoner's turn to applaud te deum laudamus cried campion te deum confitemur hec est dies shouted sherwin quam fecit dominus exultemus at le temor in illa and so with the thanksgiving and joy of the condemned criminals the mock trial ended 
when anthony rode down silently and alone in the rain that december morning a few days later to see the end he found a vast silent crowd assembled on tower hill and round the gateway where the four horses were waiting each pair harnessed to a hurdle laid flat on the ground he would not go in for he could scarcely trust himself to speak so great was his horror of the crime that was to be committed so he backed his horse against the wall and waited over an hour in silence scarcely hearing the murmurs of impatience that rolled round the great crowd from time to time absorbed in his own thoughts here was the climax of these days of misery and self-questioning that had passed since the trial in westminster hall it was no use he argued to himself to pretend otherwise these three men of god were to die for their religion and religion too which was gradually detaching itself to his view from the mists and clouds that hid it as the one great reality and truth of god's revelation to man he had come he knew to see not an execution but a martyrdom there was a trampling from within the bolts creaked and the gate rolled back a company of halberdiers emerged and in their midst the three priests in layman's dress behind followed a few men on horseback with a little company of ministers bible in hand and then a rabble of officers and pursuivants anthony edged his horse in among the others as the crowd fell back and took up his place in the second rank of riders between a gentleman of his acquaintance who made room for him on the one side and sir francis knowles on the other and behind the tower officials then once more he heard that ringing bass voice whose first sound silenced the murmurs of the surging excited crowd god save you all gentlemen god bless you and make you all good catholics then as the priest turned to kneel towards the east he saw his face paler than ever now after his long fast in preparation for death the rain was still falling as campion in his frieze gown knelt in the mud there was silence as he prayed and as he ended aloud by commending his soul to god in manus tuas domine commendo spiritum meum the three were secured to the hurdles briant and sherwin on the one campion on the other all lying on their backs with their feet towards the horse's heels the word to start was given by sir owen hopton who rode with chark the preacher of gray's inn in the front rank the lashed horses plunged forward with the jolting hurdles spattering mud behind them and the dismal pageant began to move forward through the crowd on that way of sorrows there was a ceaseless roar and babble of voices as they went chark in his minister's dress able now to declaim without fear of reply was hardly silent for a moment from mocking and rebuking the prisoners and making pompous speeches to the people see here he cried these roguing popish priests laid by the heels i by the heels at last in spite of their tricks and turns see this fellow in his frieze gown dead to the world as he brags and know how he skulked and hid in his disguises till her majesty's servants plucked him forth we will disguise him we will disguise him ere we have done with him that his own mother should not know him ha now campion do you hear me and so the harsh voice rang out over the crowd that tramped alongside and up to the faces that filled every window while the ministers below kept up a ceaseless murmur of adjuration and entreaty and threatening with the turning of leaves of their bibles and bursts of prayer over the three heads that jolted and rocked at their feet over the cobblestones and through the mud the friends of the prisoners walked as near to them as they dared and their lips moved continually in prayer every now and then as anthony craned his head he could see campion's face 
with closed eyes and moving lips that smiled again and again, all spattered and dripping with filth, and once he saw a gentleman walking beside him fearlessly stoop down and wipe the priest's face with a handkerchief. Presently they had passed up Cheapside and reached Newgate. In a niche in the archway itself stood a figure of the Mother of God looking compassionately down, and as Campion's hurdle passed beneath it, her servant wrenched himself a few inches up in his bonds and bowed to his glorious queen, and then laid himself down quietly again, as a chorus of lament rose from the ministers over his superstition and obstinate idolatry that seemed as if it would last even to death and chark too who had become somewhat more silent broke out again into revilings the crowd at tyburn was vast beyond all reckoning outside the gate it stretched on every side under the elms a few were even in the branches along the sides of the stream everywhere was a sea of heads out of which on a little eminence like another calvary rose up the tall posts of the three-cornered gallows on which the martyrs were to suffer as the hurdles came slowly under the gate the sun broke out for the first time and as the horses that drew the hurdles came round towards the carts that stood near the gallows and the platform on which the quartering block stood a murmur began that ran through the crowd from those nearest the martyrs but they are laughing they are laughing the crowd gave a surge to and fro as the horses drew up and anthony reined his own beast back among the people so that he was just opposite the beam on which the three new ropes were already hanging and beneath which was standing a cart with the back taken out in the cart waited a dreadful figure in a tight-fitting dress sinewy arms bare to the shoulder and a butcher's knife at his leather girdle a little distance away stood the hateful cauldron bubbling fiercely with black smoke pouring from under it the platform with the block and quartering axe stood beneath the gallows and round this now stood the officers with norton the rack master and sir owen hopton and the rest and the three priests with the soldiers forming a circle to keep the crowd back the hangman stooped as anthony looked and a moment later campion stood beside him on the cart pale mud splashed but with the same serene smile his great brown eyes shone as they looked out over the wide heaving sea of heads from which a deep heart-shaking murmur rose as the famous priest appeared anthony could see every detail of what went on the hangman took the noose that hung from above and slipped it over the prisoner's head and drew it close round his neck and then himself slipped down from the cart and stood with the others still well above the heads of the crowd but leaving the priest standing higher yet on the cart silhouetted rope and all framed in the posts and cross-beam from which two more ropes hung dangling against the driving clouds and blue sky over london city campion waited perfectly motionless for the murmur of innumerable voices to die down and anthony fascinated and afraid beneath that overpowering serenity watched him turn his head slowly from side to side with a majestical countenance as his enemies confessed as if he were on the point of speaking silence seemed to radiate out from him spreading like a ripple outwards until the furthest outskirts of that huge crowd was motionless and quiet and then without apparent effort his voice began to peal out spectaculum facti sumus deo angeli set hominibus these are the words of saint paul Englished thus we are made a spectacle or sight unto god unto his angels and unto men verified this day in me who am here a spectacle unto my lord god a spectacle unto his angels and unto you men 
satisfying myself to die as becometh a true christian and catholic man he was interrupted by cries from the gentlemen beneath and turned a little looking down to see what they wished you are not here to preach to the people said sir francis knowles angrily but to confess yourself a traitor campion smiled and shook his head no no he said and then looking up and raising his voice as to the treasons which have been laid to my charge and for which i am come here to suffer i desire you all to bear witness with me that i am thereof altogether innocent there was a chorus of anger from the gentlemen and one of them called up something that anthony could not hear campion raised his eyebrows well my lord he cried aloud and his voice instantly silenced again the noisy buzz of talk i am a catholic man and a priest in that faith have i lived and in that faith do i intend to die if you esteem my religion treason then am i guilty as for other treason i never committed any god is my judge but you have now what you desire i beseech you to have patience and suffer me to speak a word or two for discharge of my conscience there was a furious burst of refusals from the officers well said campion at last looking straight out over the crowd it seems i may not speak but this only will i say that i am wholly innocent of all treason and conspiracy as god is my judge and i beseech you to credit me for it is my last answer upon my death and soul as for the jury i do not blame them for they were ignorant men and easily deceived i forgive all who have compassed my death or wronged me in any whit as i hope to be forgiven and i ask the forgiveness of all those whose names i spoke upon the rack then he said a word or two more of explanation such as he had said during his trial for the sake of those catholics whom this a concession of his had scandalized telling them that he had had the promise of the council that no harm should come to those whose names he revealed and then was silent again closing his eyes and anthony as he watched him saw his lips moving once more in prayer then a harsh loud voice from behind the cart began to proclaim that the queen punished no man for religion but only for treason a fierce murmur of disagreement and protest began to rise from the crowd and anthony turning saw the faces of many near him frowning and pursing their lips and there was a shout or two of denial here and there the harsh voice ceased and another began now mr campion it cried tell us what of the pope do you renounce him campion opened his eyes and looked around i am a catholic he said simply and closed his eyes again for prayer as the voice cried brutally in your catholicism all treason is contained again a murmur from the crowd then a new voice from the black group of ministers called out mr campion mr campion leave that popish stuff and say christ have mercy on me again the priest opened his eyes you and i are not one in religion sir wherefore i pray you content yourself i bar none of prayer but i only desire them of the household of faith to pray with me and in mine agony to say one creed again he closed his eyes pater noster quies in celis pray in english pray in english shouted a voice from the minister's group once more the priest opened his eyes and in spite of the badgering his eyes shone with humour and his mouth broke into smiles so that a great sob of pity and love broke from anthony i will pray to god in a language that both he and i well understand ask her grace's forgiveness mr campion and pray for her if you be her true subject wherein have i offended her in this i am innocent this is my last speech in this give me credit i have and do pray for her 
ah ha but which queen for elizabeth i for elizabeth your queen and my queen unto whom i wish a long quiet reign with all prosperity there was the crack of the whip the scuffle of a horse's feet a rippling movement over the crowd and a great murmured roar like the roar of the waves on a pebbly beach as the horse's head began to move forward and the priest's figure to sway and stagger on the jolting cart anthony shut his eyes and the murmur and cries of the crowd grew louder and louder once more the deep sweet voice rang out loud and penetrating i die a true catholic anthony kept his eyes closed and his head bent as great sobs began to break up out of his heart ah he was in his agony now that sudden cry and silence from the crowd showed it what was it he had asked one creed i believe in god the father almighty the soft heavy murmur of the crowd rose and fell catholics were praying all around him reckless with love and pity jesu jesu save him be to him a jesus mary pray mary pray credo in deum patrem omnipotentem passus sub pontio pilato crucified dead and buried the forgiveness of sins and the life everlasting anthony dropped his face forward onto his horse's mane End of chapter six